Welcome everyone, you're watching Conversations with Alanki. Owing to the economic and political crisis in Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka is faced with numerous challenges. And in these difficult times, it's imperative that Sri Lanka maintains good bilateral relations with the rest of the world, because this would help play an important role in shaping the future of our country. Today, I'm pleased to be in conversation with New Zealand's first resident High Commissioner to Sri Lanka, His Excellency Michael Appleton. Welcome. Thanks for having me here. Thank you for being a part of this conversation. Firstly, how are you? I'm very well. I'm very well. Keeping well. Okay. So I'd like the focus of this conversation to be on the bilateral relations between the two countries. And then, of, of course, I would talk about New Zealand as well. Um, firstly, Mr. Appleton, what, what is the role that New Zealand plays in Sri Lanka? What sort of arrangements are in place? Well, yeah, you mentioned that I'm the first New Zealand High Commissioner based here in Sri Lanka, and that is a result of us deciding in 2016 that we wanted to open a High Commission here. And the reason for that is that we felt, despite having decades of uh, bilateral relations between our two countries, that we could achieve more together if we were, uh, if we were present here in Sri Lanka. And so I'm proud uh, to be the first uh, New Zealand High Commissioner here. And there are a range of issues that I'm trying to advance things on. Um, one, I think, is on the trade and economic front, trying to work out, given the uh, economic crisis that Sri Lanka is facing, how can New Zealand uh, assist with that, uh, including via expertise. You know, what, what experts do we have who could help Sri Lanka as you try and work out how to reform the economy, the country, as a result of the crisis? So that's one area. Another aspect of that is about New Zealand companies. You know, how, how can we encourage New Zealand companies to, more New Zealand companies to, uh, invest and operate here. So we've got a very strong trading relationship, our two countries, but it is very focused on one kind of product, dairy products. Um, almost all of our imports, uh, our exports from New Zealand to Sri Lanka are dairy products. And we're looking to, and that's been the case for decades, you know, since the 1970s, and we are looking to expand and diversify that. So that's an important part of the mission. I think another important part is sort of political and security ties. We think that there are security challenges that our two countries can face um, together um, and that we can you know, help each other out by sharing information um, and cooperating. So that'll be another era of cooperation. And I think um, people to people and um, sporting and cultural links are an important part of this too. We have a very significant Sri Lankan community in New Zealand. They are very keen to contribute, uh, keep contributing, but contributing more to the bilateral relationship. And uh, we are keen to harness their uh, expertise and skills as well. And an important aspect of that, I think, is education. You know, there are many, many Sri Lankans who at the moment are wanting to go to New Zealand to study. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and we want to, um, you know, help assist with that, um, both because uh, our education system is enriched by uh, Sri Lankan students, but also we think Sri Lankans coming to New Zealand and studying and then returning uh, with, you know, um, uh, their qualifications that can help Sri Lanka as well. So those are a few examples of what we're focused on. That's impressive. Uh, what has the bilateral relationship between the two countries been like over the years and more so recently? Well, so our bilateral relationship started at the very beginning of Sri Lanka's independence. So in the 1950s, uh, through the Colombo Plan, we focused on, uh, on dental training, of all things, helping Sri Lanka to set up its system of dental nurses uh, so that the dental care in Sri Lanka was of a higher quality. We brought in a lot of experts. We provide a lot of uh, money. And then, our, um, and then our Prime Minister visited in the late 1950s to help set up that system. And I actually visited um, uh, the training centre, which still exists here in, uh, in Colombo uh, today. But that was sort of the beginning of New Zealand being committed to try to develop Sri Lanka uh, as you, you know, set on your path as an independent uh, nation. Now what we really are trying to do, I mean, the context of our operation has changed. I arrived here in June of last year, obviously not knowing that Sri Lanka was about to face uh, the economic crisis of this magnitude. And uh, a real big focus of ours now is just trying to work out how can we be of assistance. I don't mean providing a huge amount of money to Sri Lanka, although we have provided assistance through the World Food Programme, UNICEF and so on, uh, to try to help Sri Lankans who um, don't have enough to eat or Sri Lankan farmers who don't have the inputs uh, for their harvests. So we've done that. But our main focus is we, New Zealand, have been through periods of economic crisis and reform before. We have a lot of 
uh, expertise uh, in different areas of policy reform to help a country get out of an economic crisis and into economic recovery. And we're really keen to ensure that we can identify the right areas that we can help Sri Lanka, um, working with the Sri Lankan authorities to work out what, uh, the, what those are. So we had our first such expert visit um, a few weeks ago. They were a person who used to um, uh, be senior in our uh, reserve bank, and they have been working with the governor of Sri Lanka's uh, central bank to work out the reforms that he needs to lead um, as part of the uh, broader government system uh, to try to safeguard Sri Lanka's monetary policy and its uh, system going forward, so that there, um, so that the the chance of a further crisis like this again can be reduced. You did speak about um, Sri Lanka needing reforms. What reforms do you think Sri Lanka really needs in the long run? Well, obviously, you know, these uh, this year's events, economic events, political events in Sri Lanka, it's very important that they be uh, that the path forward be decided by the Sri Lankan people and the Sri Lankan political leaders, not by um, you know, an outsider uh, like me. But I think some of the issues that have been discussed by the government and by uh, opposition politicians and in the media um, are def definitely worth reflecting on. I think one of them uh, that's been talked about a lot is, um, uh, is, is the revenue base of the Sri Lankan government. I mean, the, f the fundamental issue of this crisis was that uh, the government was spending much more money than it was taking in right. and that you can... Uh, that you can fund that for a while through uh, through debt, through lending, uh, through borrowing, um, but eventually uh, you need to stop doing that and you need to you know expand your revenue base. So I think the current discussion that's happening uh, about that, about changes to the tax system and how you might widen the revenue base is an important one to be having. Obviously there are debates amongst various political actors about how exactly you do that, but I think that's a uh, that's an important um, important target. Obviously, another issue that really needs to be uh, got under control before sort of any progress can be made is this issue of debt sustainability. Is you know how we owe all of this money, <laughs> we can't afford to pay it in the way that we were supposed to. So how are we going to um, you know restructure, realign that so that we can uh, get things flowing again? So those basic issues of like getting the government's finances in order, obviously. The first step, but the government's also and the opposition have also talked about um, reforms that are necessary to take Sri Lanka from crisis to um, to recovery. Um, some of those issues are very um, are very familiar to me as a New Zealander because they were ones that we had when we had our economic crisis in the 1980s. Um, and some of those are about you know there are all of these state-owned enterprises. Which of them is it appropriate? The, government keeps running, which of them should be corporatized, which of them might be privatized, that's obviously a um, that's obviously a debate that needs to be had. And also I think there's a there's a various obvi obvious debate happening over, you know, how the public sector functions. You know, is it functioning in a way that is efficient, that is delivering to Sri Lankans what Sri Lankans need. So I think all of these areas um, are areas where significant reform is required and that Clearly, Parliament is considering ways in which you might do that. All right, and like moving on to the next question, are there any significant significant contributions you've made since you became the High Commissioner of New Zealand to Sri Lanka? <laughs> any anything special? Well, I, I don't. Um, a, as a diplomat, because I'm just representing a government, I don't want to personalise it to me. But I think that um, for me, the most important thing in the first eighteen months of our um, new High Commission has been. Um, you know, watching the Sri Lankan crisis carefully and responding appropriately to a, in a way that helped uh, that, that might help the Sri Lankan uh, the Sri Lankan people. And so, um, I'm not sure I'd use the word pr uh, proud, but um, certainly I think it was a good thing that we were able to provide funding through um, th through UN agencies to Sri Lankans uh, in need. I think it was a good thing that during periods of the uh, the turmoil from you know April to July. That from time to time we made public comment about what was happening to sort of encourage um, you know all all parties to um, you know to conform to uh, principles that everybody should agree with in terms of the importance of freedom of speech, the importance of nonviolent protest, these sorts of things. So I think adding our voice to um, uh, international. Um, an international chorus on those issues. I think that was important. And now focusing really on this issue of how can we practically, by 
uh, practically help by talking to a broad range of Sri Lankans. That's one of my big job, my main jobs here is to go around and talk to as many Sri Lankans of many, many backgrounds as possible to really try and get a sense of how can we help and then think about you know what expertise does New Zealand have uh, to assist with the crisis. So I think that has been a primary focus for us um, here. But in terms of pride, I mean, I think I am proud that New Zealand decided to open a high commission here. Um, uh, I love Sri Lanka. I love um, uh, my interactions every day with, with the Sri Lankan people who have always been uh, so kind and friendly to me. And I'm proud that my government has invested um, in Sri Lanka. Um, and um, I'm really hoping that we can, um, you know, in the coming years, uh, you know, go on a journey with Sri Lanka as it uh, as it recovers from this very difficult situation. And I'm sure it's, it's no easy task because it would have been, um, I mean, it would have been a really different experience for you experiencing uh, the protest and and the crisis. It, it's definitely not something you anticipated. No, and I think the um, I understand that um, I understand why a lot of people in Sri Lanka. Um, feel down about what has happened this year because it has a, it had a very neg negative impact on a broad range of um, of Sri Lankans. But I, I'm also a um, glass half full kind of person, and I think that uh, Sri Lankans should feel pride in the events that happened in the streets through um, from whatever date you want to pick, pick from May through July. In the sense of, you know, this was a significant people's movement. Um, uh, with great diversity um, throughout um, all parts of Sri Lankan society um, who were unhappy with uh, the situation in the country and peacefully uh, demanded for change. And, uh, you know, that's what's meant to happen in a democratic society. People are meant to, um, uh, in a non-peaceful way, uh, protest things that they don't like and ask for political change. And I think that the way that that unfolded for, you know, for almost all of it was... Um, was very um, was very laudable, um, and I also think. I mean, the other thing I would say about uh, I, um, the other thing I'd say about the this, this situation is that, um, despite all of the challenges that the Sri Lankan people have are facing, um, uh, the country today um, is um, has held together. People are focusing on how can we try to improve the situation. There are obviously, as there always are in democracies, messy debates about what is the correct way forward. But those are, deba those are debates that are happening uh, peacefully, that are happening democratically, um, and that is the way that Sri Lanka will need to continue in order to, you know, to, 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 to get out of this um, situation. All right. Um, New Zealand is a founding member of the United Nations. What is the impact of the UN in these challenging times? as we head into what experts say could be a global recession, and um, given the fact that there is a war happening. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the first thing to say is that, yes, these are very, I agree with you, these are very difficult times uh, the world over. The, you know, the very acute cost of living issues that Sri Lankans are facing are being felt, albeit in a more mild way, around, around the world. Uh, that's putting pressure on uh, peoples and governments uh, everywhere. Um, and, yeah, certainly the uh, the war in Ukraine is another um, intensifying uh, factor. Um, in terms of the United Nations, you know, I think um, for small countries like New Zealand, also like Sri Lanka, um, we can't afford to live in a world where essentially the largest or most powerful people in the world get to decide what happens. <laughs> we rely on um, a global system, uh, which includes the United Nations, in which all countries, no matter how small or how big, get to have a say and be part of a debate about how issues should be resolved. And so we were proud to be founding members of the United Nations as a small country wanting to ensure an international system which listened to small countries. And we're a proud and active member of it now. In terms of the UN's role, you know, I think um, I mentioned before the financial assistance to the, um, uh, to the Sri Lankan crisis that New Zealand has provided through various UN agencies. I mean, I think one of the under-talked about role of the United Nations uh, throughout the uh, throughout the world, but particularly um, in, in the Sri Lankan crisis, is that um, they have um, experts across a wide range of issues 
in countries like Sri Lanka, they are able through their convening power, able to attract funding and then funnel it in efficient and appropriate ways. Much better than the United Nations agencies, whether it's the World Food Program or UNICEF, um, they funnel money from a whole lot of countries into uh, the children of Sri Lanka or needy people in Sri Lanka. Far better that happens than a hundred different countries do their own thing. So there is that sort of convening power that in sort of uh, situations of difficulty or development that they play um, a really important role. In terms of um, the war in Ukraine, my government has been very um, clear and vocal that we um, vehemently oppose um, Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. Um, uh, it has uh, wrought um, uh, immense damage to uh, Ukraine and its people. Um, and, um, you know, we're very focused on working with our partners in the international community um, to try and assist uh, the people, um, the people of Ukraine. Um, but, I mean, I acknowledge though, I mean, leaving aside the centrality of that issue for the people of, um, of Ukraine um, itself, that, um, you know, that conflict has certainly had impacts in Sri Lanka too, that there are a range of things that contributed to the, cri the economic crisis happening sure. here, and then a range of things that made it worse than it would otherwise have been. And uh, certainly the war in Ukraine is, you know, on the list of things that uh, made things worse. Yeah. Did it directly affect New Zealand? We have a we have a Ukrainian community in New Zealand, and um, uh, and certainly they have been they've been directly affected. And um, you know to hear their stories of their loved ones, you know, having their country uh, illegally invaded, uh, and uh, you know the the people that they've lost. That's very sad to sad to hear. But the I mean, New Zealand's interest in this is that. Uh, New Zealand wants to live in a world where countries are not invaded and taken over by larger, more powerful countries. <laughs> we are a small, isolated country, and mil militarily we are not able to prevent if a larger country wanted to come and take over our country. We wouldn't militarily be able to prevent that. And we want to live in an international system where the norm is, if a large country decides to invade one of its smaller neighbours, that the international community is vehemently opposed to that, and will do whatever is in its power to uh, to support uh, the country that has been invaded. And so that's why we've taken such a strong uh, position on Ukraine and uh, will continue to do so. And you did, you did say you love uh, Sri Lanka, um, and Sri Lanka is undoubtedly one of the best tourist destinations in the world. <laughs> Can we expect more tourists from New Zealand? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, uh, you know, we've had this period of um, disturbance created by... Uh, firstly, COVID, um, when New Zealand closed its borders and so it was far harder for New Zealanders to go overseas. And now we've had this, I guess, this disturbance of the economic crisis and, um, you know, raising questions in people around the world, is this the right time to come to Sri Lanka? But I think, you know, certainly an important uh, part of my role is uh, uh, whenever I'm talking uh, with New Zealand audiences to make clear that, um, uh, you know, no matter what... Um, uh, New Zealanders saw on their TV screens in uh, May, June, July that now <laughs> Sri Lanka is a very good place to come um, uh, come to on holiday. Um, and you know, I think the opportunities that exist here uh, because it, uh, you know it's a small, compact island. There are so many different parts of the country with different um, different vegetations, different animals, all of those things, uh, different beaches. It just makes it a really great package. <laughs> And so I think, you know, New Zealanders are at the moment, we're about to head into our first summer uh, in which, I guess, first summer post-COVID. Um, and uh, I'm very much hoping that a number of, uh, you know, a, a broad group of New Zealanders will consider, uh, will consider coming here. Um, all right. Um, and New Zealand's colleagues, I mean, when you talk about New Zealand, um, everyone talks about how it is such an ideal place to live in, um, great quality of life and... Um, a relatively low crime rate. How does New Zealand achieve this balance? Um, I mean, I I agree that New Zealand is a place with a very good quality of life. I um, obviously, I don't know, whatever, 30, 40, uh, 30 years ago, I grew up in New Zealand and uh, found it a great place to, you know, to grow up <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, peaceful. You could, you know, walk around. You could go anywhere you wanted without your parents. Um, a great deal of freedom. A lot of open spaces. A lot of, um, a lot of uh, cool things to do. 
And I think that's that's definitely true for tourists who come to New Zealand as well. Is that um, uh, they find a play, they find a country that is um, that is clean, that is fresh, uh, that is friendly, um, which there are lots of interesting things to do, lots of interesting scenes to do. How do we do it? I mean, I think um, you know every country has its problems, um, but I think you know New Zealanders um, uh, New Zealanders are very focused on trying to create a society in which there is, um, you know, social social peace, um, that all different kinds of New Zealanders uh, can, um, you know, live together um, um, in harmony. And as I said, we have, pro- we, we have our own problems and nothing is perfect. But um, I think, you know, focusing on a, having, a, having, a, um, having a government system and a society that you can have confidence in is quite important in that. So some of the you know, these global indicators when it comes to things like good governance and perceptions of corruption and those kinds of things. New Zealand rates very highly. And I think those things are quite important because if people have trust in their government systems, I don't mean in a specific government or politician, but in the government systems, and trust that more or less, you know, that your money that you pay and taxes is going to give you um, the things that you need from the government. If you have that basic faith, then things are easier <laughs> than than if they're not. So I think I think that is an important part of our um, uh, that's part of our success. The other part I, I mentioned social peace. New Zealand is an extremely diverse uh, country. Um, we have um, the indigenous people of New Zealand, the Tangata Whenua, the Maori people. Um, make up about 15% of our population. Um, our Asian population, the largest parts of that are the Chinese and Indian uh, um, origin New Zealanders, but there's a significant Sri Lankan community too. That makes up another um, 10, 15%. And then a very large Pacific Island um, community for, um, whose origins come from the Pacific Islands. And um, what that all means is that there isn't um, the especially if you live in our larger cities, um, you have a sense of living in a very diverse culture where there are lots of different kinds of people around you. And there is a huge emphasis, I think, both in in government, but also in our culture of everyone trying to get along. And I think that's an important um, aspect of our success as a country too. That's just beautiful. Um, Like you said, um, New Zealand is diverse and it's really important that you get along and, and I'm sure that's a lesson that many countries can really take. Uh, moving on to our final question, what has your experience in Sri Lanka been like? Well, um, obviously the crisis and COVID have made it like strange times here, um, as it has been everywhere in the world. Like I feel like uh, you know, all human experience has been, you know, significantly altered by uh, the COVID crisis. Um, and then in Sri Lanka, it was doubled down with the economic crisis. So um, I think that's made my experience here a bit different than it otherwise would have been. But uh, having said all of that, uh, um, I am still struck by uh, the kindness, the friendliness, uh, the positivity um, of the Sri Lankan people and the generosity of spirit. And what I mean by that is that um, uh, no matter where I go, no matter who I'm interested in talking to about what's happening here, everybody always um, responds to me with, you know, an open heart, open arms. Uh, they're, um, you know, keen to get to know me, keen to get to know New Ze- about New Zealand, um, and keen to talk to me about what, you know, what their area of expertise is. And that sort of like default friendliness um, and default kindness and default generosity is not true everywhere in the world. It is a particular aspect of Sri Lankan culture. As a diplomat, I've lived in lots of countries and default kindness and generosity and friendliness is not, uh, does not happen everywhere. And I think it's an aspect of Sri Lankan culture that is extremely um, uh, you know, noteworthy and praiseworthy um, because it means that as an outsider, you're able to get um, you know, great insights into, into what's happening here, but also um, that you really do feel that as a as a guest in this country that you are welcome, and so I guess that's my overwhelming feeling is that I um, I feel and uh, certainly my wife, my son, we um, feel extremely welcome here, and that means that so um, my son is four, and when people ask him where he's from, he's from he says he's from Sri Lanka because he was I guess two when he got here, 
And he wouldn't say that if he wasn't like really happy and have all of these Sri Lankan friends who'd enveloped him with um, with love. That's and amazing. I think that's a good metaphor for how I feel too um, about my experience here is that we are, um, we've been treated in a very kind, friendly way at a time when Sri Lanka is going through uh, so much. And so from that perspective, I, I feel very lucky and very grateful. All right. Um, I'm glad you've um, had a good experience in Sri Lanka amidst the crisis and all the and, and the turmoil and chaos. Thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you for this conversation. Uh, we have come to the end of this conversation, thanking His Excellency Michael Appleton for this conversation and wishing you all the best. Um, I'll be back with a new conversation soon. Until then, stay safe and take care. And if you did like the content on my YouTube channel, do subscribe, leave a comment. I would appreciate your feedback.